Okay, we're live. Hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> I'm hey. Dr. Patty Ashley. Welcome to Shameless Facebook Friday Lives and the special series on grief, grace, and the holidays. I'm really looking forward to our conversation today with a, a, a sweet friend of mine that I met years ago. Um, hello out there to Elaine, Cal Elaine Collins for introducing us many moons ago and, and her networking group, one of our dear friends. Um, and I've gotten to know um, my guest today through the years, and I know that she's experienced grief in her life, and she's created a program called Carpe Diem, which I love because it means seize the day. And I think that's our lesson, right, is to always learn to seize the day. So I want to introduce um, my guest. She's a leadership coach. She's a blogger. She's created her um, Carpe Diem uh, program. She does all kinds of great things to help people um, with grief and and connecting. So welcome, Yvette Francino. Am I saying that right, Francino? Yes. I've never really said your last name before. <laughs> Hi. Thanks for joining me today. Hey, and Patty. I'm very honored to be here. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us a little bit. I know I mentioned briefly about you, but tell us a little bit about you and and how grief you know is, is a part of your life's work and i know it's a big open-ended question but yeah i think really um this carpe diem movement that i've been a part of had really started uh, because of my friend craig dunham who had als and he died in 2010 so since 2010 i've been a a strong advocate for for uh, ALS awareness, and uh, his name Craig Dunham. The the initials CD are like Carpe Diem, and so uh, I created this emblem that is C and a D and sort of shaped like a heart, and uh, that was the emblem for Super Carpe Diem Woman. So I also created this. That's my Facebook picture. Still is um, my super carpe diem, I'm all super ha ha your hero like, but I, I have the CD emblem. And then, you know, you can have a CD uh, was sort of, and it looks like a cool little superhero um, emblem. So we, we created these, you know, uh, CD um, superhero emblems for the walk to defeat ALS. The, the, that in 2014, I, one of my goals was to be the top fundraiser for for um, mm -hmm. for the walk to defeat ALS, and so I gathered up all my friends and network, and uh, we all dressed as superheroes for that walk. And so that's really kind of how it began. But we, uh, it was really an effort to, um, I think, in some ways, it's a way to process your grief is to try to do something that will feel like the person didn't die in vain, that their message still is going on, that you're going to try to preserve their legacy, that you're going to pass on all the wonderful things you learned from them. And in the case of Craig, uh, I, I, uh, learned also just the grace, you know, that you talk about so much, um, how he, through his journey with ALS, really, I was able to witness such grace that it helped me a lot with, with being okay, I think, with dying and, and helping to recognize, uh, you know, again, how, what a difference it makes, how different you know, it made me think a lot more about grief, and I've learned more from your book and your teachings and things like that. And um, so that's what Carpe Diem Day got to got its start. And well, I didn't say Carpe Diem Day. That's how the Carpe Diem movement happened. But I really do a whole bunch of things with this Carpe Diem mantra. And last year, for my 60th birthday. Uh, I did this whole 60 weeks till 60 project and I was very intentional about having these one-on-one -on -one kinds of celebrations with a lot of different people and my kids and friends 
oh, surprise me on my birthday, they you can purchase a national day. And so they uh, gave me National Carpe Diem Day for my birthday. Mm-hmm. And that, uh, and, and wrote this wonderful thing about how I was inspired by Craig and how I, you know, do these radical intentional celebrations and things like that in, in honor of, um, you know, living life fully. So I, I felt like, okay, I have to live up to this tribute. And, and so, you know, that's been my mission is to, um, spread, spread that word about living fully and, and, you know, trying to find joy in, in the ordinary and, and really just, um, spend this life recognizing every moment is precious and, and, and how can we live fully during this time? So, yeah, no, I love that. And, you know, studies of resiliency have shown that people who give back, you know, find a purpose for, you know, things that have happened to them actually are the most resilient. So it's why I do what I do. And it sounds like what Carpe Diem is about for you. It's a way to give back from, you know, having been through grief and ALS, I know is, is a terrible disease and it just, it, it drags out over time, you know, as the person is, is um, losing. Yeah, it is a tragic, tragic disease. Um, however, I know, you know, grief comes in, in all different forms. And I, I have, I know you've experienced a lot of grief uh, in your life and, I, I've had three major deaths during my lifetime and each of them was different and the grief feeling was different. The, f- the first one was my brother when I was 35, he, or I was 37 and he was 35 and uh, he died in a car accident. So that was by far just the deepest grief because it was so unexpected and he was so full of life and, uh, it, it just was surreal. So that's, you know, this like, I cannot believe this happened to, to him kind of feeling. Um, and the second was my dad who uh, died from cancer, colon cancer. He actually was, but he, he'd he been having a lot of near death kind of issues with his health and he was 75. And so that one was, and I do think for a lot of people as close as you are to them, if they've had a full life, if you've had some time to process uh, that they are dying and you've had some, and, and definitely in the last couple of years of my dad's life, once he had the cancer diagnosis, I mean, he, we, we did get closer and we did spend more time together and there was this recognition that this might be the last time we get these kinds of visits and things like that. Um, and then the third one was Craig and with that one, we did have the recognition because he had ALS. Um, that was different because, as you said, it's a very tragic disease in that you learn, you lose all the function to move and to speak. So that deterioration was extremely difficult to witness. Um, but what was so good about me being able to witness and having the experience of having that last year really of being uh, spending quite a lot of time with Craig is he, it, I learned so much again from witnessing this this grace that he exhibited you know that he still found ways to have find humor and play and mm-hmm. and an attitude that was so admirable so often mm-hmm. when I think about him. And I, even during that year, I mean, I'd cry for sadness of knowing that he was dying and that he was going through so much, but also was just out of inspiration and awe at how, how he could exhibit such this one, this attitude. Um, and so, you know, I, again, each experience is different. And then since then too, you know, I've had other friends that I've lost not none that were as close as as Craig but it is just always a sadness and a a shock but I I think you do start to build some resilience and some recognition again of that this is part of life and um 
you recognize that a lot has to do with how the person who died is how they feel about death and how they're handling it, especially if it's a terminal illness. And um, I know with both of your father and Lawrence, they both died suddenly. And, and again, when it's sudden and you really haven't had time to process that, again, is just yeah. such a shock on the system of, you know, it seems unreal. And it, I think that that's yeah. extremely hard. So, um, well, when you're talking about um, Craig, it made me think about Tuesdays for Tuesdays with Maury. Yeah. And, um, and lessons, I think in the subtitle is something like lessons learned from dying or something. Yeah. Um, and I, I also heard Mitch album speak. A couple this week, a couple of days ago, he was speaking live um, at an event, and uh, yeah, he had some quotes from Tuesday. But what my experience with Craig, he lived in Evergreen, and which was about an hour drive from where I live. So I would go. So it was Sundays that I would go visit him, and um, so I always thought it was kind of like I was Sundays with Craig. <laughs> you know, it's a lot like the Tuesday yeah. with Maury. Yeah, and, yeah. And and you, you talk about some of those experiences in your blog. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I do. I really, um, you know, in preparation for coming to talk to you, I was, you know, reminded myself, I, I kind of Googled different posts that I had. I wrote a lot about um, my experience with Craig and during those, during, during those visits and, you know, again, it, it was very inspiring. So what, some of the things were, um, he, he, when he he lost his ability to talk quite early. It, it, ALS affects people differently and of when they lose what kinds of functions, but mm -hmm. he was very frustrated that he couldn't talk. But I did recognize that you can talk a lot with your eyes. I mean, it is, uh, it is, amazing how you know again just you can kind of read people's moods by their eyes and he still was had expression in his face and he was able to mouth mouth words mm -hmm. so we we found ways to communicate um but um but yeah i i i kind of made notes of some of the times here's one Post, I'll talk about this final conversation that we had. And again, we're, he's not talking, but I, I, he, he got to a point where he couldn't swallow anymore. And early in his diagnosis, he had, you know, they were talking about whether you get a feeding tube once you can't swallow. So, um, but he decided not to get the feeding tube. And so we knew that um, that death was imminent at this point, this, this last conversation that I had with him. Uh, so um, I went up to visit him like I always did. And I asked him, is, you know, you're not getting the feeding tube, is it because you want to die? And he shook his head, emphatic shake of the head. I was determined to tell me he was not depressed or suicidal. He did not want to die. And then I was like, then why not the feeding tube? And then he was a sympathetic shake of his head, eyes telling me he was sorry, but he he didn't want the feeding tube. And and then I said, because you're ready to die. And he nodding, so oh. eyes telling me I got it right this time. He had lived a full life. He had not let this disease stop him from living as fully as he could, but now it was time. And then me saying, but I'll miss you. And then... Um, sympathetic nod, eyes telling me he knows, but telling me that I must let him go. And I remember reading that from your book too, Love is Letting Go. And, um, you know, I can't, it's hard. I, like I said, I, I can, those memories, uh, they, they do make me cry all the time, but I do think he had so much strength. He never was crying through these times, he was looking forward to uh, the next, you know, being with the, with God. He had a very strong faith and he was not afraid to die. And um, he was 
worried about me and his friends and it's certainly his children, um, but he was ready to, to go. And um, that just, again, gave me a lot of strength myself. And I, I wrote you know, this other thing that said, um, in, in that final conversation with him, I knew that everything was going to be okay. This, this was a prompt we had to, I was in this writer's group and there was a prompt about writing about everything is going to be okay. So I started saying, you know, there's all kinds of things we worry about all the time. And one of the things we always say, you, you, like even with COVID, this will pass and it will be okay. Or when we have an illness, we say this will pass and it'll be okay. But in the case of when Craig was sick, it's like, no, you can't say everything's going to be okay because you know he's going to die. And you just keep getting worse and worse. And I would think, how how can people with no hope, how can they keep going? And, um, but, you know, I had that conversation and I knew it was going to, even in this, in, even with imminent death, he was not going to survive, but everything was going to be okay. That faith of his was so strong. He didn't have a bit of doubt or fear in his face. He was full of peace and reassured me with his eyes that everything was going to be okay, better than okay. He knew he'd be in eternity with God. I have always wished for a faith as strong as Craig's. I know I'm nowhere close, but witnessing his faith helped strengthen mine. Just like I knew there was a God the moment I held my baby, I felt sure at that moment during that last conversation with Craig that he would be with that God after his death. And I realized that no matter what happens, even when we don't survive, everything is going to be okay. In fact, for anything like Craig, it's going to be downright glorious. And so, you know, again, that being with him and experiencing that him, with him, saying goodbye to him really helped me um, recognize that after, you know, the death will be okay. And um, how old was he when he died? 50. 50. So, so yeah. 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 And um, so I, it's, you know, but it is hard for those of us left behind because we we miss the people we die, or the people we die, the people we lose. And, um, um, you know, there were so many things that struck me from, from your book, um, Patty, as well. I wanted to, uh, I know that you keep Lawrence alive with so much of what you do and even quotes from from your book because he his work was about grief as well right mm -hmm. so i if you're okay with this i mean i wanted to read something that struck me that in your in the eulogy you said he left a legacy of love that will live on forever in my heart and in all of yours and then the, these were his words i believe you were an expression of love before you were born you will return to love when you pass between your first breath and your last breath, your true mission is to remember the love that you are and to extend this love all around you. And I, you know, I, I, I love that because it just really does, love is the emotion that I've tried to figure out, you know, that I, I one year I was doing a whole, um, the love project is what I called it. And I blogged every week about different kinds of love and what does love mean? And it's such a, it's such a elusive emotion and there are so many different facets to it, but it really uh, is tied. It went, you know, I remember hearing once something about if you are grieving, remember that that means that you loved that you, your grief is really the loss or the feeling like you don't have that love anymore. And so savor that love, keep that love within you. And I kind of feel like this quote from, from Lawrence is saying that, you know, be the love, keep this love. And we keep the love from these people that we learn from alive by spreading, spreading that word. And that's what you do all the time. So yeah, I think you're right. Love, that word is misunderstood so much. And um, 
it really is infinite. And it is, I believe, what goes on after, um, reminds me of a song, Crowded House, called, it's called She Goes On, you know, and she goes on in the wind and the trees and the, you know, and I, and I do believe that. I don't understand it. It's a mystery, you know, what happens after we die. But I do think that there is something that connects us all. And love is probably, in my version, the best way to describe it. Yeah. But I, I, I sort of feel like that's what the grace is that you're talking about, that final stage of grief is that, you know, the love that is around us still that is encompasses that feeling that we had for the person that has moved on to yeah. that and life, whatever that is. What Lawrence said to me when he was developing his curriculum, we were just starting to date and he was very excited about, you know, teaching this course from fear to love to grace. And he said, you know, I just discovered that there's just, it's just more than love. It's more than love. It's, it's, it's grace. <laughs> you know, and it is because, you know, I think break a broken heart cracks us open to something even more than, than our human minds can comprehend. And yeah. And I do think that is the grace. And it's also, I, I love the little messages that I feel like I get from him. Like when the ladybug showed up, mm -hmm. Oh, and we have a special thing with ladybugs. Have you had experiences like that after your losses? Like, you know, some people have feathers and pennies and, you know, little, yeah. just kind of get a song that comes on the radio. Well, definitely the songs. Um, I, it's, it is interesting that I, um, after my brother died, I don't remember. I think you might have talked about a little bit about this in my in your book too. But I would have a lot of dreams that seemed so mm -hmm. so real that it felt like this is more than a dream. You know, this is yeah. this is like my ability. You know, this communication with and so you know again. It, you really never know, is this definitely, you know, what is this communication from the afterlife or not? But um, I, with my brother, um, that I would have dreams almost every night. And most of the time I, and in the dreams, he was alive and we were talking and, and or, you know, it, everything, and I, and then when I woke up, it would be like that hard reality of he's, uh, he's dead. I, that was just a dream. And uh, so it's kind of like the dreams were great, but then the waking up was hard. And, um, but I do remember one, and this is the one that did feel the most like this felt like not more than a dream it was, um, uh, a, a very strong message, kind of like this, everything will be okay thing. This was my brother saying, it is okay. You know, that, uh, you know, I am okay. Yeah. It, don't, you know, don't be sad. And um, it, it was the first time that I woke up and I was kind of like, yeah, I feel like that was a real, that was a real message from him. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like you know i'm not scared because i do think that um you know i grew up catholic too i know you you have that in your book about growing up catholic and uh, the messages of heaven and hell and and what's happening and i mean when somebody that you love dies and you know my brother chris was you know he was a good guy but i'm sure he did things that that weren't going to send him straight to heaven. Although we did have a St. Christopher's medal on and there is a, a thing that says that you go straight to heaven. I think if you have that, but I mean, you do have all these, like yeah. what really is the afterlife and what if I don't have all the, didn't follow all the rules or, you know, and I just, it, it was like, I cannot um, bear to think that I'll die and I'll, and it will be nothing or that if, or that I wouldn't be able to see him again someday. And so um, you you go through all these questions in your head about the religion and am I just believing what I wanna believe so that I'm not scared of dying or, you know, and it's, it's, it's so difficult to kind of, 
come to terms with not, you know, the mystery of the afterlife. And um, I don't remember where I was going with that. Um, but I, I think, you know, again, that those fears, they, they really would bring up the fears of death. And, and that was why I said, I think I was, again, this message that when I had that dream or communication from, from Chris, it felt like he was saying, stop being so scared that, you know, it will be okay. And, uh, yeah, and I think that's why a lot of people are afraid of death is because they've, you know, learned these things. You're going to go to hell. I used to, I remember when I was growing up, I used to think, well, that's not fair. If somebody goes to confession and they confess that they've murdered somebody, they're going to go to heaven. But if I do the, you know, I have to work really hard not to do those things. And, or, you know, it, it didn't make sense to me. It's like, oh, you just I know. forgive me I know. Father, and then you're, you're good. So you could really do anything. But <laughs> <laughs> I know it is. And a lot of religion is like that. Like, does this really make sense? And um, yeah. and I know, and I really think it doesn't make sense that what we believe will determine whether we go to heaven or hell. I mean, you know, I don't feel like that was the teachings of Jesus Christ. And so it it, it is confusing. And, uh, you know, you certainly, you know, want to do whatever you, you know, I know. I was always a rule follower. I was a big rule follower. So like when I was a kid, I would like be, oh, okay, this is what I'm supposed to do to get to heaven. Sure, I'll, I'll learn all these prayers and I'll, do, and I'll go to confession every week just to make sure if I die this week, will <laughs> my soul will be clean. And, um, but uh, it, it, it is, and I do remember um, the first, speaking of religion and death, um, the first real grief I experienced, and I've read that this is true with a lot of, kids the first grief they experience is a pet and um so when i was 10 so just a year younger than you were when you lost your father and again that's so difficult for a child to have to deal with that so you know to to have grief so young but when I, when my cat died that was sort of the recognition like oh my gosh everybody dies and this is terrible and you're so so sad i mean i i cried so much and was in a big big grief when my cat died at age 10 and would go and write letters i mean we buried her sort of in the yard and i would put letters in the in in, in under where the grave was and so where this ties to religion is then i went to my ccd class was the catechism class that i was going to and um i asked the teacher you know, do cats go to heaven? And she told me they don't, that animals don't go to heaven. Oh, no. <laughs> so then my mom comes to pick me up and I'm crying and she's like, what's wrong, what's wrong? And I'm like, you know, the teacher said that the cats don't go to heaven. And um, so anyway, she was like, okay, wait right here. And I could hear her just like chewing out the teacher, like, how could you say something like that to her, you know? And, oh my gosh. Um, yes. And so. Um, up for you that they do go to heaven. <laughs> I don't, you know, uh, um, I, I don't know if there's anything in the Bible that talks about whether or not animals go to heaven, but apparently there, you know, it would have been better for the teacher, I guess, to say, I don't know, than to say, yeah. no. Um, but uh, anyway, so uh, that that little incident, you know, again, is just a childhood thing of how these things develop in your head. And, and but that was when I started having this recognition of everybody is going to die someday. Yeah. And um, and then but then I remember even thinking, but but, you know, it will be a long time. Uh, you know, just like usually people will reassure you, you don't have to worry about this till you're, mm -hmm. you know, till it's very, very many years. And, um, and, um, you know, you, you ha did have that big grief when you were just a child. And I know how you said that people kind of were wanting you to get past it and not really process that grief. And, uh, and now I, I've done enough of your class to recognize how harmful that can be without kind of going through it, without really 
processing it and and experiencing it and um so again kudos to you for for helping people i i know um i think i don't know if a lot has been learned about the psychology of of grief over the period from when you were 10 till now or that you know you've done enough exploration on your own to recognize these things. I mean, we have Elizabeth Kubler Ross to thank for that. And that was just what she started her her books came out in, in what the eighties, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And and then David Kessler has kind of taken her legacy and added the sixth stage of grief, which he calls finding meaning and I call grace. Yeah, I like that. You know, so yeah, we didn't know. And lifespans were a lot shorter too, you know, at, at the beginning of the last century. And, you know, we're living longer now. And mm -hmm. yeah, and people didn't know. And religion was such a, a, um, a thing that people would hold on to. And it can be so destructive because of that, you know, because like, you know, what you know, the cat doesn't go oh, well, how do we even know what heaven and hell is as a kid anyway, other than, you know, the fear, that's what was put into me was, oh my God, you know, you better be good or else you're going to burn. Yeah. <laughs> when I burned my hand, my grandmother would say, see, that's what it's going to feel like all over. Oh you know? gosh. You know, gosh, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's bad. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't have, you know, anybody really threatening about hell was thank God because that, Honey, yeah, that would be very scary. Across the street from the church and the school, 12 years of Catholic school. And yeah, and then I kind of, when I discovered later, you know, about all the sexual abuse that had gone on with people very, that I knew that I was very close to, um, and the hypocrisy, you know, I no longer participated in the church, but there's the underlying spirituality of all religions that to me is what is the same, but the humanness of putting all of that fear and power and control, you know, and changing the story for whatever reason the, you know, religion chose to do that. I mean, it's a whole other conversation, but the idea that kids don't understand permanence of death until about seven or eight, um, because of the way they think, and then you know, heaven or hell becomes this huge, huge construct that 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 they make up and can be very scary. Yeah, so, yeah, and then to be told just you know, people die and they go to heaven or hell, and then your life goes on, and that's all there is. You know, I mean, yeah, that's why I do what I do because I feel like wow, there's so much more. I think grief is our biggest teacher. You know, I mean, it teaches us about life. Like you were saying, you said that earlier that, you know, you learned so much about carpe diem, you know, yeah. the importance of seizing the day and, and living life fully. And the more we love, the more we grieve, but we don't like to feel pain. We, we don't, mm -hmm. we humans are at least in our American culture here. We, we try and, and gloss over things and, and, you know, they call it um, lawnmower parents, you know, <laughs> trying to smooth things over. Right. And, and really the thing is, how do we, as Glennon Doyle says, how do we um, know that we can do hard things, right? And that the life is full of hard things and we're in it right now in this pandemic and there's so much collective grief and that so much of our what's familiar in our life has ended as well as literally people dying and mm -hmm. the, the devastation of this disease. So you know, I think we have to have these conversations, which is, you know, again, why I do this, talk about legacy and giving back and, and helping people, you know, have a safe space to do that. And so yeah. I really appreciate your stories because I think we learn a lot from people's stories. And, and I learned a lot just listening to you tell us, you know, these pieces of how your heart opened in your loss. And Carpe Diem Day, what are we going to do? Are we going to like, is this going to be like a thing that Hallmark Cards going to like? <laughs> well, I have to say, you know, that was my goal was like to get this on the map. I mean, it's 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 in the National Archives. Uh, but so then I, there's, you know, I've really gone all out on trying to 
find all the places that create that put make the calendars or have the websites with the the national days and wow there are a lot of national days <laughs> there are so many um from everything you know to national margarita day is actually one of the more well-known ones but i think today in fact my friend because i'm into this stuff i have friends that say happy whatever it is one of the days it is is today is happy happy national absurdity day so <laughs> I mean, you know, I like that one. Kind of absurd that we have so many days for every single day. And so it, I have come to the recognition that it will be pretty hard to be, uh, you know, they have these national day calendars. So every day it will tell you today is national make your bed day or whatever it is. Um, but they pick one of the so many that there are. And I don't think they're ever going to pick National Carpe Diem Day because, for one thing, that's kind of hard to have a picture for that. I mean, um, you know, usually they have one that they can put a picture, like Make Your Bed Day. They can put a picture of a, a made bed or a Margarita Day. You have a picture of a Margarita. But sure, you, sure. you know, what's that? You've got your logo. Yeah, there is the logo. But I, I and I did on my on the net on the website. Um, there it and there's a whole bunch of ideas of how you can celebrate the day. So my um, idea about it, because there are people that were like, well, it's supposed to be seas every day. So do we really want a national carpet DM day? Because that means people just wait until till till that day. Um, <laughs> but I mean, it's just like Mother's Day or any of our days. It doesn't mean we don't honor and celebrate our mother every day. I, I mean, it's just a day to remember to seize the day throughout the year. And, um, and I, um, when I, so I was talking about trying to create a national Carpe Diem day before they, I was gifted with it. I wanted to make it on May 30th, which was personal for me because that's the day I lost my brothers and and he and, and it's Memorial Day as well. It's it's the actual Memorial Day, even though it's observed on the Monday, I think the last Monday in May or something. But um, but the real Memorial Day was May 30th. And I always I do think that Carpe Diem Day, part of it, I want to be about kind of like Memorial Day or it doesn't have to be about a veteran or somebody who died in the war. It could be. Who have you lost that we can pay homage to and and keep their legacy alive uh, on this day? Let's let's have those those happy memories of our ones who have passed. So kind of like Day of the Dead, I think is like that. Um, and you know, honor some traditions that they used to love, and that's that's what I'm sort of suggesting for Carpe Diem Day. Um, or just, you know, again. So what day is it? Well, they they made it on my birthday, February 26th. Okay. So, um, so yes, I will be sending my friends uh, <laughs> ideas of celebrating Carpe Diem Day. And, you know, um, originally, like I said, before I knew they were going to give it to me and I wanted to have it on May 30th. And I was even talking about that, but my kids had already put all the paperwork in and done everything. So it was going to be a birthday surprise. And, you know, they were like, well, are you disappointed that it's on your birthday instead of on May 30th? And um, they wrote such a touching tribute uh, that I was like, no, I mean, this, this now can be sort of my legacy. That's super... Um, yeah, super exciting for me to feel like, you know, and again, I doubt that it'll be come famous or be on calendars or anything like that. But mm -hmm. at least in my family, they'll know that this was mm -hmm. sort of my legacy, that it was important for me to, mm -hmm. uh, to, to live fully and to pass that message on to others and to know, you know, that I want them to to always remember that there's always this saying about don't cry because the person's gone, smile because they lived. I, I think that was Dr. Seuss that said something like that originally. And, you know, I've heard that at different memorial services that you, 
you're sad for yourself because you're going to miss that person. But it's similar to what we were saying before about grief is really um, a form of love and that you want to remember the love. And so, um, so yeah, I was, you know, definitely it'll probably be my, the most meaningful birthday present that I ever received. I, I'm very excited about yeah. and honored to be, you know, the recipient of Carpe Diem Day. And, um, yeah, and so, and yeah, it, it, it's so fitting for you because you have so much enthusiasm for the things you do and your creative ideas and to have a day like that on your birthday that, yeah, it will be your legacy even when you're not around all the other people who were involved will continue um, to remember you and to remember all that you've done to help people, you know, really seize the day. And, and, and I, 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 I and, you know, back to Tuesdays with Maury, the quote that I always quote from there is how he said, life pushes and pulls and it's, the tension it's learning how to live in the tension of the opposites and i talk about that all the time because there's such a paradox of of both and in what you were saying it's like there's the grace and the love that always goes on and then there's the human grief that feels painful and i think it's really hard for us to hold both and you know i always say my clients always don't i know it's both and it's both and it's both and because we try and split we think well if i'm in grief then it's going to always be this bad it's horrible and i got to get out mm -hmm actually makes the grief worse mm -hmm. and if I'm feeling good I want to stay there and I don't ever want to feel bad instead of recognizing that life pushes and pulls and living in the tension of the opposites Carl Jung even said that you know it's yeah. learning how to embrace paradox really and I think yes really hard yes and I you know I've really been studying positive psychology mm -hmm. really since Craig's death and see that, you know, life is all about, you know, it is that paradox. There are good things, there are bad things, there are sad things, there are happy things. But a lot of it, if you are, it is those bad and difficult times that help us not take for granted the, the good and the happy and the joyful. And uh, another, so th this month, I've really been focusing on joy um, as part of my Carpe Diem I, I'm doing a podcast too, and I was very happy to have you on that podcast. And um, just there's yard work going on out my window. Is that distracting? Is okay. Care. Okay, yeah. good. Um, so uh, I started a new season on Carpe Diem Connection podcast about joy because have you heard of Joyful, the, the book? Uh, Ingrid Patel Lee is her name. She wrote a book called Joyful, and she has joy spotters on a Facebook group where people post pictures of things that are bringing them joy. And she has a lot of different worksheets and she has something called the joy makeover. So where it talks about joy and time, joy in relationships, joy in money. And she talks with different experts about that. So I'm doing a whole kind of spin off of that. And, um, I really do think that there it, it is interesting too that you know that you do find more joy I think if you've experienced grief I I I I don't I don't want anybody to experience grief before they have to you know it's it it, it is a, a terrible emotion and as much as we're talking about how we learned a lot from experiencing it um it, it just takes a, a carefree innocence away from you when once you've experienced a deep grief especially i think at a younger age and so mm -hmm. so difficult for you to have had to experience that as a child and um uh so but I do think again, then you are just really much more savoring the joyful moments. And so I, um, I just yesterday had a session about finding joy during COVID and the holidays this is kind of, you know, like what we're talking about now and that our, our tendency can be to, if we're depressed, that we just withdraw and are, are I mean, certainly if we're going through deep grief, it's really hard to, you know, feel happy about little trivial everyday things. But um, 
since doing all this work with positive psychology, I've recognized and really gotten in a habit of just seeing so many, like a smile from someone or a text message or a card in the mail that's unexpected, or there's just so many things throughout our day to be grateful for and that do bring joy. And that when we are in grief or sadness or depression, it, 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 it sometimes it almost feels insensitive. Like, how can I be happy about that when this terrible thing happened? Um, but I have learned that that's the time you need to be. You need to tell yourself or, or you know, take some time every day to, yeah. to take those pictures and write in the journal and notice those those things, even though, again, I know it doesn't take away from that, and it's not to distract you from processing the sadness because you still have that too. Mm -hmm. But um, I think it's it's easy to just kind of get so inundated with that that it overtakes your your mind, and you just want to hide under the covers and um, to try to spend some time. Um, seeing some of those joyful things, which is a lot easier to do if you get in the habit of doing it when you're not in grief, I think. Um, but anyway. Well, I think there's the, you know, the idea of being able to be with the pain and how important it is to tell the story and to have the memories and to share the memories. And there's, there's kind of a, kind of a, tension of the opposites, even in that, when I think about it, you know, and, and I think the most important part is in grief is to find those enlightened witnesses, people that can hear our stories. Yes. And, and, and people are afraid to do that because they're afraid they're creating more grief for the person. But I know from my experiences, that's all I wanted to do was talk about Lawrence. And yes. And, and I would have loved to, as a kiddo, talk about my dad, but it was like, no, we just don't go there, you know? No. And, and so to so there's shame for me in terms of being able to find a way to tell the story. So when you're talking about the joy in the pain, I mean, it's it's almost like there's there's some well, pain and pleasure are actually the same part of the brain. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we're when we're in our grief and we're telling our stories and we have that enlightened witness we're actually also honoring that person as um, Martine Prechtel says it's grief is praise, you know? And so there is some joy in, in even that, but it's, it's the, here's the, the destructive part is when people tell you to get over it and, yeah. you know, just get up and, and go do something. And, or, you know, my friend um, Kim Murdoch, who wrote a book called um, feeling left behind permission to grieve because so many people told her, just get out there and start dating again after mm -hmm. a year or two. She's like, I don't want to, I want, I'm still in grief. And so it, that's what we resist persists and often grows stronger. And so I think that's this fine line between being able to hold the tension of the opposites and be in our grief and the memories. So we can get to this deeper experience of carpe diem and joy yeah. and, and, and back to life. And it's hard to think of them both existing together, but they can. I mean, I the story I always tell is one of my clients who her brother overdosed the same day she went out on her first date with this man, and they just actually bought a house together and they're they're moving in together. You know, a couple of years after after they met, but she was like, I can't be happy. I can't be dating. My brother just died. Yeah. So yeah, me. I know it is. It's such a it's such a weird feeling of, you know, that you do sort of have this feeling that it seems disrespectful to be happy when you, um, when you've lost somebody so important that you loved. And, um, and I also know, like you said, the people that try to console you, uh, I've been, you know, through enough, different deaths to recognize, first of all, that everybody's going to be different in how they respond and what their grief feels like. And then there are so many platitudes of different people saying different things and maybe intending to be, you know, positive, but they, I've come to recognize this is one of the, one of the 
benefits, I think, of having experienced grief is that you have more compassion and understanding for other people who are experiencing it. And just, it's so much easier to talk to someone who really, you know, they, they get it. They understand what this grief thing is all about. So when somebody who either doesn't really, do, isn't experienced the same grief because maybe they don't know or love the person who died or, or haven't been through a deep grief themselves or whatever, when they give you the, the advice, um, it, it feels a little like you really don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But on the other hand, if you are hearing it from someone else, you're, you're more like sharing together. And a lot of times you are, it, it is, you do just get so much more comfort from people who are experiencing the grief as well, you know, and you share the stories. And a lot of times you do, I know at my brother's funeral, we were, we were laughing about a lot of things, you know, and that it's that, you know, you're crying and you're laughing all at the same yeah. time. And, and you just are, you just want to stay in that space with other people that are, you know, that loved him too. And I, I, I know you, you recognize that feeling and, um, you know, you, you feel kind of when, when people then get back to normal, it's just like, I can't get back to normal. You know, you, you want to keep being in that space of let's keep, yeah. talking about yeah. him and as long as it takes. And I think that's the other thing too, is people, you know, take for granted that, you know, and, and that's the one thing I would say too, when people ask, what do I need after Lawrence died? I said, I need you to check in with me three months from now. But everybody forgot. I mean, there was maybe one or two people that would have heard I said that, you know, because people just go on with their lives and they don't realize that, you know, grief, you know, especially with it when it's sudden, like you said, and you're in shock for a period of time, and then you move into the into oh this really happened, and then you really need people to show up. But people are thinking oh well it's been three months now, so she's yeah. she's probably fine. And I think that's so important um, for people to realize how much we really need them to reach out because we don't really know how to ask for what we want or even what we do want. So I really encourage people if you know anyone who's experiencing loss to reach out to them even months, years later. I mean, this is the fourth anniversary. Actually, this would have been the fourth, uh, no, sixth, sixth, sixth year anniversary of our Lawrence and I's first date. Oh, wow. so he actually died like- Two days before, or a few days before your first Yeah, date. yeah, and so, and then his, so his memorial service was on the date, which would have been the second year anniversary of our first date. Yeah. So, oh, um, well, I, and, and, and it's right here in holiday season too, right before Thanksgiving. And, you know, that's a difficult time, no matter when the person dies, I think is the, the holidays because you're, you're, you're missing them. And, um, but especially when I'm just thinking of a funny story now that you mentioned that. So we had our first date and then he went to Vermont to visit his sister. And he and I was like, are we going to have another date? You know, was he, and he texted me and he goes, do you want me to bring you a turkey from Vermont? And I was like texting my friend, is, is he serious? <laughs> was he serious? Turkey? <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> love meeting you. Bring himself back. He was the turkey. Right? Oh, he was the turkey. <laughs> Not bringing me a turkey. But yeah, and so there's these memories. Of, and then Thanksgiving, I remember making stuffing the first Thanksgiving after he died to take to my friend's house. And I just remember I was making massive amounts of stuffing thinking, I don't even know how I'm doing this, you know? <laughs> so we have all these memories that I think are, so even thank you for letting me share these stories and, and, and reminding me of these stories and sharing your stories because it, yeah, it, it it's, it, it, it brings the memories closer when we get to share our stories. So thank you so much for this time. Yeah. It was great. I also want to say, I just, when you were talking about the tips, that that was another great thing in your book. I really enjoy that, um, you know, that you have what to, 
you know, what to do when somebody's in grief and how to, how to help them. And I, I, you know, the book was wonderful. I appreciate reading that. I'm glad that right now I'm not having, you know, even though we've got COVID to contend with, I don't know anyone that's sick with it or has died. And I feel so grateful for that. And, um, and, you know, we all are experiencing the collective grief of this, but the vaccines are on their way, which is wonderful. And so it, the t end is in sight where we can look forward to, um, to things, hopefully getting back to pre-COVID, uh, pre-COVID feeling of being able to be with each other. But in the meantime, we do have these holidays and, and you know, again, this is a difficult time for many, and I'm sure it must be for you as well, very much so because well, of the ones. We talked about the gratitude practice in positive psychology, and I was thinking about that this morning about Thanksgiving, you know, and how everybody's all, you know, shook up about not being able to necessarily be with family like they're used to being with family or they're going to do it anyway. And then, you know, our, our governor here, I don't, you're in Florida now, but I don't know if you heard Paula I, say, I, I read it this morning. kill your grandmother you know, for Thanksgiving dinner. Yes. <laughs> what, what did it say? He said, you could kill your grandmother if you were to have things. Oh. Wow, like he doesn't hold back, right? I mean, so there's yeah. so much talk about the paradox of the, of the gratitude and grief. There's so much grief around how we're going to do holidays this year, even though, you know, I know as therapist, holidays stir up all kinds of unconscious um, uh, memories and, and uncomfortable feelings and, and family systems. But that's a whole other piece. But trying to redo uh, holidays different and Thanksgiving being a day of gratitude. I was thinking this morning, you know, how important our gratitude practice is. And so even if our holidays aren't what our Thanksgiving isn't necessarily what we're used to in terms of the big table with all the people and, and, and all the food and everybody touching everybody's spoons, <laughs> which we can't do anymore. Um, you know, there are still things to be grateful for. And I think that's really, you know, the neuroplasticity on the brain it, it creates new neural pathways that say I'm safe and I'm okay and this too shall pass and I'm grateful for what I do have, you know, whatever that is in our Thanksgiving days, even if they're not what we're familiar with. Um, yeah. so. well, hopefully they'll be more memorable and in a good way, in a creative way. I know that's how I felt about Easter, but now, you know, it's several months later and we've all Kind of zoomed ourselves out and um so we'll see how how it all goes but yeah i i uh i hope people can have that gratitude and joy and with knowing that there's an end in sight to covid and um and being you know, what is right now i think that's the tricky piece like what is there to be grateful for even in the midst of this crazy mm -hmm. world because people are very stressed about it so um, I want when we're finished for you to put how people can find your blog and what you do in the comment section because I think what happened when the Scott scheduled we ended up doing a separate stream from the original schedule so I want people to be able to find you because I think what you're doing is great and we're going to all celebrate Carpe Diem Day with Yvette next year yeah. on February 26th. Um, so maybe, maybe we'll get back together too sometime around that. Oh, that'd be fun. All right. Well, thank you so yeah. much, Patty. Had and, a and I just want to mention too, that my course on grief is live now and people can find that on my website. I'll also post that in the, um, section over here and I'm taking it and it's great. I'm really enjoying it. Good. I mean, it's got yeah. some, I wish I had taken it before. But it's good. It's actually good to take it now, experiencing grief and preparing myself for the next time I experience grief. Yeah, good. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a inner. It's um, not interactive. It's do it on your own. Uh, PowerPoints and videos and very well done. Impressive. Yeah. Thanks, Yvette. It was so fun to talk to you and happy Thanksgiving to you. And thank you. We'll um, talk again soon. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.